print books, e-books, and books on CD are now widely available, and many people download books and movies onto their phones and e-readers. 3D printers introduce people to the possibilities of new technology. Even Elon Musk uses a 3D printer to produce space capsules. The library is a community anchor. People often prefer to live near a library, perceive library access as part of an enhanced quality of life. The locating of a new branch library in the Baker Street lot would invigorate the north end of downtown, which seems to be in a bit of decline, with high rents leaving many stores vacant. It could link the beautiful public space around City Hall to the north end of Wyndham, offering opportunities for extended, invigorated public space and attracting more people to the businesses in the downtown core. As we witness some alarming developments south of the border and the rise of populism there, it is my belief that poor public education, a decline in literacy, and poor access to information are partly responsible. One more sentence. The library is a facilitator of a civil society, a functioning democracy, and an educated populace. Therefore, I plead that we waste no more time in publicly funding improvement and expansion of Guelph Public Library, even if it means increasing the inf infrastructure levy to 2%. Thank you. And thank you very much. And is there any questions at all? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, Duncan is already down. And Susan, I saw you here as well, so that's good. You're coming up next. Mayor Guthrie, councillors, I'll admit my bias right off the bat. I spent most of my teaching career as a librarian in both elementary and secondary schools. And my libraries were happy, welcoming, and vital places in the schools, very popular with a variety of students. And that's the way I think most libraries ought to be. And that's certainly how I perceive my neighbor, which happens to be right down the street, the Guelph Public Library main branch. I perceive my role here as being that of a fan trying to persuade the skeptics among you, if not the naysayers, that libraries are hugely important in all our communities, whether it be just in a school or in the city. Coincidentally, I'm just back from a visit to California where I visited the high school library that I managed from 2002 to 2007. It has undergone a major expansion and renovation since I left at a cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's odd because only a dozen years earlier, I'd inherited that same library, newly renovated, from my predecessor, which had cost, again, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, the library skeptics among you, perhaps including the mayor, might wonder why the school administrators and then the school district administrators and then ultimately the school board would attach such importance to this library to be throwing well over a million dollars in a facility which you may feel to be an obsolete institution. I'd suggest that clearly in that community and in that school district, it's widely accepted that libraries are tremendously important to their young people and their education. I say the community too, because shortly before I left in 2007, the city of Milpitas opened a new state-of-the-art municipal library at a cost of some tens of millions of dollars. That shows commitment to literacy, service to the community, and a strong vision for the future. Why not Guelph too? Milpitas, I hear you wonder, where the heck's that? It's in Santa Clara County, which you may better know as Silicon Valley. Mr. Helmut van Helleman, unfortunately, isn't here, but he'd be acquainted with that name, I'm sure. To the skeptics and naysayers among you, I wondered what new perspective or facts can I bring to you to persuade you over to our side? I hope my new information perspective will encourage you to re-examine your beliefs and convince you to support the building of a new library here. But how could I do that? You've heard from so many people, friends of the library, who make their personal appeals. Mr. Kraft has provided you with tons of data, all sorts of numbers to bolster his case for a new building, and before him, Kitty, of course. What could be my different angle? What if maybe the most technologically innovative and advanced community in the world, arguably, could demonstrate to all of us the shape of the future in terms of libraries? Are there public libraries in Santa Clara County, in Mountain View, Cupertino, San Jose, Palo Alto, Santa Clara, and so forth, having to close branches, put off modernizing and renovating, lay off staff because of lack of community interest? 
to remind you, these communities have some of the best educated, most creative people in the world. Are they wedded to their personal cell phones and computers and the whole astonishing digital world of electronic media at the expense of using their local libraries? So, I phoned and I got some recent statistics for you yesterday. There are about 797,000 members of the libraries in, the, in that Santa Clara County who have access to millions upon millions of books, DVDs, e-books, and so forth. They had in 2015 to 16 over 10 million visits by these patrons among 32 libraries. Their budgets exceeded $80 million a year. The spreadsheet provided to me had over 100 columns of data, which I won't repeat any of. I can, however, assure you that the senior administrator I spoke with stated that their libraries are thriving, vital places in their communities. So why is it that Guelph can't have such a facility offering us all a modern, visionary, green building? Last week we came home across America by an Amtrak train using a route made by visionary surveyors. The route from California to Chicago was largely planned and built during the 1860s when there was hardly anyone living in California, the Sierras, the Rockies, or across the plains. Why? Because they were visionaries. They looked into the future and recognized that railways were going to shape the future. And similarly, of course, I have a little blab about uh, Andrew Guthrie, also, uh, Guthrie, Andrew Carnegie, slip of the tongue, Andrew Carnegie building all these libraries and so on and so forth. So uh, in summation, I just want to say that I really, really think uh, it's high time for this council, if not the successor council next year, to commit uh, to building a new library for our young people and for even old guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and is there any questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Okay. Uh, Susan Carey, you're next. And Anne, I saw Anne here. You're old, we look at you. Thank you very much. Hello, Mayor, Council. My name's Susan Carey, and I am one of the founders and coordinators of the Guelph II Library. So I'm coming from a slightly different perspective today. I'm not going to tell you how wonderful libraries are. What I am going to say is it is well known that uh, younger generations are not into ownership. They are spending their money differently. One of the things that we do know is that they are interested in moving from a asset-based economy to an access economy. What they want to do is they want to share, they want to go to, they want to spend their money on the service economy, they want uh, hubs where they can access things. And so that's the kind of thing that we need to be investing our money in as cities. This is the kind of thing that uh, Guelph's growing and very healthy sharing economy is beginning to offer more and more. And the library is the main linchstone in all of that. It's what the rest of us really can build upon. And certainly the library has been very supportive to us as the Guelph Tool Library. And I hope to see more and more of that happening. One of the key things I want to ask you is that when you make decisions, about the library, remember that there are no cons. It's all pros. And the other thing is, don't think you know what a library will look like. Don't close any doors in your decision making for what that library might look like in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just, just make sure uh, as a comment to you that, and anyone, that when it comes to the vision of a future of a library, it's really, really important that everyone's involved in the engagement process with the board between now and, uh, and February, right? Mm -hmm. So make, make sure that, that that is sent out there because it's actually them that oversees that uh, operational functionality discussion. So thank you very much. No questions, right, anybody? Or No? Okay, thank you. 
And so that was a good segue to you, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the, the chance to speak to you tonight. Normally, the uh, past board chairs don't come and speak about this kind of thing. A couple of community members asked if I would just come and speak about the vision of library, not this particular library. And so um, I'm happy to do that. There are other wonderful champions to talk about square footage and budgets and, and timelines. Someone said to me recently, uh, the library has always been about books. And, and I very gently said, I, I think libraries aren't actually about books. They're actually about the places to share information. We just did it through books. And now we look at doing it through books plus e-resources that I know Andrew would say are available 24 hours a day, through multimedia tools, through website classes, through gatherings. And, and even uh, what we're seeing more and more in North America is that people are saying, um, and I, I will say this as a stereotype, that the idea of using a library used to be a more solitary experience. I went and picked up what I wanted. And now we're hearing people say, I want to come together. And, and I think the most powerful reason to come together is to hear someone who doesn't think the same thing I do. That's so important. And, and you do that when you come together here. I often ask organizations in my working life, um, what, what will people say about this community because you exist? Not about your organization, but about your community. And I think that what any community values, we incubate. And when you think about wonderful recreation centers, I think about incubating health and teamwork. I think about hospitals, and that's incubating healing. Our houses of faith are a place to incubate spirit and how we, we walk with that in the community. And for libraries, I think it's about incubating minds and curiosity. And certainly schools are an important place of incubation. But a library is a place where you decide what you want to learn. Your curiosity is the powerhouse that indicates what you want to learn about. And what we have said as a city and as a province and as a country, that curiosity is so important to incubate, we will ensure that it happens for free that no matter what your income level, your cultural background, however long you've lived in this community, your sexual orientation, nothing should bar you from exploring your curiosity. For some, a library is a place of entertainment, which is wonderful. For others, it's a lifeline. It's, a, it's an avenue for applying for jobs, accessing um, government services, connecting with family, gathering spaces, and um, even a place we've seen recently to exercise some of the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation gatherings. And uh, I, I, want, I do want to say that the library board and the staff are not the guardians of this project. As you can see here, we're not the only ones who care about it. And I know you do too, whether you are ready to go ahead right now or you're being thoughtful about it. Um, we uh, simply act as the stewards of this dream. And I do want to take some time, because I know not everyone knows how far we've come with City Council, and through you, Mayor Guthrie, and to City Councilors, we appreciate all your support, and we also appreciate your wise questions. And to Derek Thompson and the senior staff, you folks have worked so hard to build uh, a pathway together with us. And I know that when you have good partners, doesn't always mean you agree, but it means you keep coming back to the table. I know Derek and his team and Steve and his team have been great about that. So on behalf of the library board and the staff, I want to thank you. I look forward to the day when we fling those doors open. And whoever asked about uh, digging the shovel in, I have a shovel that is just waiting for you. So thank you so much. There is one question uh, sure. from Councillor Downer. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Mirda, and I just... I want to clarify one thing, like um, last, I think it was last week at the board, there was a motion uh, stating that, and a pr subsequent press leave, that the board supported the city's financial strategy on the uh, 
on the new library. Yes. Is that so? I just want to be clear about that. <clears throat> that you understand how the funding works. Your Absolutely. staff have been working with yeah. the city yeah. um, on that strategy, and the board is fully supportive yes. of the, uh, what we have this year, next year, and in the next year yes. after for the board. Yeah. Because actually, the I think it was this council. I think it was unanimous the vote to include the library in the RFP. Yes. So and there's no question about support yeah. around, your understanding is that there's no, support, no question about support around yes. this horseshoe, about including it in there. there may, when the business plan comes back, there may be some other issues sure. coming up. Yep. Yep. We're prepared to have discussions yeah. as we go I on. I just want to clarify that yep. the board has supported the city's yep. financial strategy. Yep. Okay. And I would thank Tara for all her support. We've, you know, we've dealt with the nuances of this and the big picture. And yes, we're absolutely on side. Great. Thank you. Thank you, and thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Emren, am I saying that right? Okay, great. CK, are you here? CK Sharma? Are you here? No? Okay, we'll go you, and then uh, if CK Sharma isn't here, Ian Finley, you're in the wings. Emren, uh, welcome, go ahead. Uh, good evening. Um, I know some people question the relevance of libraries today because of like the dominating, the dominating um, technology dominating era that we live in with the phones and all the information that we have. But the thing we have to understand is that the library is so much more than just books. Um, I know in uh, London, UK, they reinvented the whole concept of the library and um, they changed it to actually the, they called the idea store where people can come and take classes, they can grab a cup, a cup of coffee, and, um, and they can buy ideas, meaning that they sit down with other community members and they share everything they know. So therefore, it is wrong for us to think that the library has an outdated concept. A library is a space where you have the power, where you are in charge of learning about the world and becoming what you dreamt of. It is first a place of pursuit of happiness, then education secondly. Um, I know personally, when we migrated from Afghanistan, um, we were real poor when we came here. So we went from shelter home to shelter home. And I know that I called the library home. That was my first home. That's where I met community members. That's where I made my first friends. That's where I learned to speak English. And that was really my home for me. And I know that the immigrants and the refugees who come to Canada today, it's the same thing for them as well. <clears throat> the library is not just a place where they can learn. It is a place where they can get to know other community members. And the community members can get to know the new faces of soon-to-be Canadian citizens. So the library is a whole lot about community. And one of the most important things that I learned growing up, because I spent a lot of my time in the library, was that the fact that every individual learns differently. And with that, when people come together at the library, we can share our differences of, 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 the, of the information that we have. They help, we help each other to learn better and progress our ideas. I'm a University of Guelph student, and I've spoke to a lot of students, and they say that the place they learn the most is at the library because students come together and they learn new things that they might have not understood outside of the library. So, and the library also, I've noticed as, as, as a Muslim that there's, there's, there's not as, the, the unity is not as strong as it used to be at the mosques and around in the neighborhoods because of their religious differences or cultural differences, whatever it may be. But I know at the library, when they walk in, they leave all those things outside. And they actually get to know the person that they really are, and other community members as well. So overall, the library brings different people together from different educations, different backgrounds, um, different levels of income, and I believe that point right there, that unity, is what makes the community richer 
And that's what the library brings for the community. So libraries are not just about books. It's about so much more. So I hope in the future when you ask yourself, why do we need libraries in today's day and age? I hope you think that libraries en enrich individuals, but more importantly, en enriches the community as a whole. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions at this time for everyone? No. Thank you, thank you very much. And just before uh, Ian comes up, C.K. Sharma, I just want to make sure I, I didn't miss. Okay. Uh, Ian, you are up. And Mary, is Mary Maholland here? Yes, you're, you're up next. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you to members of council for providing me this opportunity. My name is Ian Finley, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the Friends of the Guelph Public Library. The Friends of the Guelph Public Library are your, one of your funding partners for this new library. Um, so I, I'm here to, uh, I'm, he, I'm actually speaking on behalf of Virginia Gillum. She normally uh, speaks on behalf of the Friends of the Guelph Public Library, but unfortunately she's not here today. So sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you get me. <laughs> Uh, I've got three things that I'd like to uh, share with you this afternoon. Uh, first, I've got some thank yous. Uh, second of all, I've got a little story. And then finally, I've got a reveal. Um, so the thank yous is uh, to members of council who've been helping us out over the years. I know this year, uh, Councillor Gordon, Councillor Hofflin, Councillor Alt, Councillor Van Helleman, Councillor Downer, and Mayor Guthrie helped us out. And it's, it's greatly appreciated. And I know others have helped us out over the in other years, so it's, it's greatly appreciated your contributions. But it's more than just that, it's we've got a crew of about 300 people who pull this thing off. It's really quite a, quite a stunning thing. So this is my little story then, it's about what happens sort of behind the scenes. And it, and it happens uh, shortly after Christmas, we start looking for a location. Uh, this year we were uh, very lucky to, the Woods organization generously donated their space to us and we're very grateful to them. <laughs> We don't always have a secured space, and we don't have a secured space for 2018, so we start looking for a space. We put the call out, um, and there's lots of meetings about that. We go and look at locations, um, and then we start around Labor Day, we start really ramping up the organization. So we have folks that are donating the books, you know, they, and we use our library system, all the branch system, as a, a depot to collect all the books. Uh, then we have a, a crew that actually goes to all the branches and picks up these books, and they do it regularly because the books start stacking up. If you don't, we don't pick them up in a day or two, the library's calling us and saying, like, you got to get over here, we're running out of space. So there's that whole crew. Then we, we, get, we get our space, we've got a, a sorting crew. And these folks work three or four days a week, and we have two shifts, about four or five hours each. There's hundreds of hours go into this, this event. It's really quite remarkable. And then we, as we get down to the short strokes, the event, um, <clears throat> and then we start bringing our retail team in. We've got the Joe Coffee that comes on, on site, which is fantastic. Um, and then, then there's the day, this, then there's the event itself, which is another, it's just madness. It's organized, but it's, Madness, and I think the first night we have a $10 cover charge. I think we have a thousand people lining up just to come in and buy books. It's really quite a, quite a remarkable event, uh, and it's all all weekend long. And as you know, we just had it this last weekend, um, and so here is here is my reveal. Um, we have, uh, my goodness, thank you. Um, we're our bookkeeper still a little hedgy with the numbers, but we're. Pretty confident that we've again, for the third year in a row, secured $100,000 from this book sale. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's impressive. So, so with that, it should bring our total that we're raising to bring to the table. We're about $630,000 currently. Uh, and we fully ex expect to be bringing a million dollars to the table when, it, when the library finally gets built. So we're really excited. We are definitely a partner in this. You guys are not alone on this. We're, we're here to help and support the community with this. Uh, and with that, I will um, conclude my comments. And happy thank to take any much. questions if there's any. I, is there any questions at this time? Okay, thank you very much. Good, thank you for your time. And Mary, I did see you uh, come down. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Webb. Are you, are you here, Jonathan? Yes. Okay, great. 
Hello, Mary, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, I, too, am a member of the Friends of the Library, and I volunteer every year for the annual giant book sale, which we've just had. We had 95,000 books, um, and it was another great success. It was our 11th year. I thought I'd give you a slightly different and personal perspective on the whole library issue. Our current central library building was erected in 1965, I believe. In 1965, I was 18. I was starting first year university and I wore mini skirts and I had white go-go boots. My husband and I moved to Guelph with our two-year-old son in 1979. I was 32. Seems really young now. The first community facility I always look for in a new uh, place to live is the library, and we've been using the Guelph Public Library for a continuously evolving variety of needs ever since. The staff has always been great. The main library building has always seemed to me unable to keep up with the demands placed upon it. So I've followed the history of the new main library building for a long time. In 1995, the idea was being debated privately and publicly. I was 48. We witnessed a number of site surveys, consultant reviews, favorable city council votes, etc. In 2000, chief librarian Norman McLeod and councillors were actively talking about plans for the new building. The Community Services Committee recommended that it be included in the city's five-year capital budget forecast, and for a time it was. In fact, it's news to me that it was actually included three times. It, the cost would be $10.5 million. I was 53. In 2001, the current building was again publicly deemed spatially inadequate. In 2002, a draft report to City Council said that the main library was less than half the size it should be for a city of more than 100,000 people. The cost would be $19 million. In 2003, the handsome Art Deco Canada Post building was identified by Council as the preferred site for the new library. The total cost would approach $20 million. On the evening of February 12, 2005, I was in the council chamber audience, excited to be witnessing what I expected would be the historic moment when the purchase was finally approved. We all know now what happened. I and many others came away stunned and horrified by the short-sighted decision by that council not to buy the building. People I meet still bring up the subject and express dismay and regret. I was 58. Well, now it's 2017, and this council has demonstrated the courage and foresight finally to allocate funds for the design stage and commit $56 million, as I understand it, to construction in 2020. I'm now 70. The two-year-old son is now 40 and lives in Guelph with his wife and five-year-old daughter. And we all use the library for many different resources and services. My two points are, one, that the costs keep going up. <laughs> and they're not going to go, start going down, but they, they would keep going up, so we've got to nip it in the bud. And more importantly, perhaps for me, Lives are going by while we wait for this wonderful building that's so urgently needed. It will contribute immeasurably to the downtown and to the quality of life for Guelph citizens of all ages. So I want to express my congratulations, my gratitude, and my admiration to this council for your decision. I will try my best to live long enough <laughs> to see and enjoy the new Guelph Central Library. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Uh, very well written. And uh, uh, Councillor Alt has a, a question. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Mayor Guthrie. More of a comment and a, and a, and a comment of appreciation. Uh, I think the history lesson on the lost opportunity from uh, the, the 20, 2002 is very important for us to, to understand. That's a $56 million question we're now debating, and it wasn't at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Jonathan is in the wings. Thank you. J Jesse. Yes, yes, you are here as well. Thank you. And whenever you're ready, uh, sir, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Guthrie and members of council. In July, I had the privilege of addressing you on the subject of libraries, what they can do and what they should be. Today, I want to talk about the process that's being followed to get there, or at least to, to the extent that I understand it. And I will cheerfully accept correction if there's anything I'm misunderstanding about that process. In general, in a layperson's terms, there are three steps to take before embarking on a building project. First, we describe the project, what functions it must serve, the minimum specifications. I think we would do this if we were building a police headquarters or a city hall. Um, second, we would cost the project. And third, we'd determine how we're going to pay for it. What we're doing here with respect to the library, as far as I can understand it, is to omit those three steps. We're going directly to a request for proposals that says, to, in effect, to developers, make us an offer. By the way, it must include a library, and we'll, set, we'll get the details later. What's wrong with this picture? First, sending out an incomplete RFP seems to me to be a bit sloppy. It strongly suggests that we don't have our act together. City staff have assured us that this is fine, not to worry, and that's their job to make the best of things when they're not getting proper direction. But it's really not a great way to do business. Second, it's weird. The city has been talking, as we've been heard already, about the need for a library since 1995. In that time, there have been any number of studies, there have been consultant surveys, site searches, and yet here we are, putting out an RFP, lacking a detailed description of what we expect to see built. This seems to me to be shocking. But this is where we're at. So the pro what is the process going forward? Again, as I understand it, the library board's consultants report will come down in January. I assume it will, it will include a wish list of the items the board hopes to see in a new library. I'm not clear on whether it will include an estimate of costs or just provide the information that will make costing possible. It won't say how it will be paid for because that's up to the city. Now, I'm not an expert at reading and understanding budgets, and I want to be clear about that, too. I will welcome corrections if I'm wrong. I have seen in the city's budget documents and heard earlier um, the amount of $56 million as a rough cost to the library, and that's somehow been factored into future uh, deliberations. I've also seen the following quotation from the city's capital investment strategy, 2018 to 2027. As previously highlighted, this is a quotation, the 2019 to 2027 capital forecast is not fully funded. Even with a continuation of an annual 0.5% increase via the dedicated infrastructure levy until 2026, the level of funding would not be sufficient to accommodate all the projects identified. I read this to mean we don't know where the money is going to come from. So to recap, here's where we're at. We're sending out an incomplete RFP and following it up with a list, a wish list, describing the likely a library we'd like to have without any, any indication of where the money's going to come from. So presumably, we're asking the recipients of the RFP to suggest an answer. If this is correct, it's not fair. It's not fair to developers who are going to consider the RFP. It's not fair because developers don't make civic decisions. They make business decisions. The solution they're likely to come up with will make sense to them as business people. It will not necessarily make sense to those of us who understand what a library can be and should be. We're asking developers to do the city's job. And here's the danger. If I were a developer, I would have seen first the sloppiness of the incomplete RFP, and I would have sensed the weakness in the city's position, having no clear commitment to what it wants and no indication of plan to pay for it. And I'd come back with a modest proposal. I'd say, how about I give you 20,000 square feet in the basement of a condo tower and charge you an exorbitant rent to pay for it? And that would be the beginning of a negotiation which is the, in which the developer holds all the cards. I'm reluctant to say that I want to stop the RFP, if that's even possible, but I suspect it's not. 
We've waited a long time to get to this point, but I'm genuinely concerned that the process we've embarked upon is going to lead to either complete failure when we actually get to the discussion of how it's going to be paid for, or to a really bad deal for the city. In any event, we need to slow the process down so the city has a better chance of controlling the outcome than is presently the case. I believe that by entering into a multi-million dollar negotiation with the developer from our present position is essentially setting ourselves up for failure. Thank you. Thank you. And is, thank you. Is there any questions at this time? Uh, seeing none, thank you. Jesse, yes, you came down, so that's uh, great. And Maggie Laidlaw, you are up next. Hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, good evening, councillors and your worship, Mayor Guthrie. Um, I would like to start this delegation by recognizing the history of First Nations and Attawandaran neutral people of whose land we are on and the neighboring First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Today, there are a wide number of indigenous people who call this territory home under the Haldeman Track Treaty with the Mississaugas of New Credit. I would also like to extend recognition to the Black Heritage Society, just steps from City Hall, which between 1820 and 1860 served as a destination for nearly 30,000 black slaves escaping to freedom in Canada through the Underground Railroad. Um, October also comes as a month of recognition for the LGBTQQIP2SAA community. For those of you who don't know all the acronyms, that is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, oh, I had this memorized. Uh, intersex, pansexual, two-spirited, asexual, and allies. Uh, on October 6, 1998, 19 years ago this month, Matthew Shepard attended a meeting of student LGBT group at the University of Wyoming, went out with friends, went home, and went to the Fireside Bar and Lounge. At about 11.45 p.m., Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson arrived at the Fireside, ordered a pitcher, and went to the pool table. The two men soon returned to the bar, approached Shepard, told him they were gay, and the three left together shortly after midnight. The men drove over a kilometer out of town when McKenney demanded Shepard's wallet, then proceeded to beat him with the butt of a .375 Magnum pistol. They then bound Shepard's hand, tied him to a fence, and began beating him. An autopsy showed that Shepard received 19 to 21 blows to the head, with the final blow irreparably damaging his brain stem. 18 hours after the attack, a cyclist fell near the fence where Shepard lay and called for help. On October 12, 1998, Shepard was pronounced dead. This month of October, we not only recognize Matthew Shepard, but also Queer Identities Week at the University of Guelph, Spirit Day Nationwide, and Asexual Awareness Week. To this day, the LGBTQ plus community still faces discrimination and violence, as seen in the United States, with bathroom bills in transgender military service, and in places abroad, such as Chechnya. Only this year, Canada passed Bill C-16, an act to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act and the criminal code, criminal code to include gender expression and identity as a protected ground. Um, now, how it relates to libraries. Um, my name is Jesse. I'm vice chair and library chair of Out on the Shelf. We are a queer library and resource center, and we're located just across the street. Um, on October 20th, 2005, we opened our doors to the public, and since then, we've worked as a team of complete volunteers um, to contribute to Guelph's inclusivity and provide LGBTQ plus resources to the community. Libraries serve as a central hub of information. None of the history that is being recognized this month would be retrieved without the archives protected by libraries, such as the Guelph Public Library. As George Santanea once said, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. With Guelph Pride celebrating 15 years in 2018, Out on the Shelf continues to broaden archives along with the Guelph Public Library, the Civic Museum, in turn, creating history along with many other important organizations in Guelph. I would like to emphasize that a progressive library would never be just books and archives, but rather a central hub that allows community to be connected to one another and to their history. They are also a place that allows new technologies to be accessed and a place where higher learning can always be accessed by those who seek it. Guelph is home to a diverse population of Guelphites and, helps, and hence a new library has the potential to be an indispensable hub to, for community connections and for Guelph to maintain its status as a progressive and inclusive town. Investing $57 million towards a new public library is not only essential, but imperative if we are to ensure the survival of Guelph's diverse array of resources, knowledge, and history. 
1883, the Guelph Public Library was the first public library in Ontario. In 1883, the town of Guelph make hist made history. If we want Guelph to continue making an impact, we need to continue forging paths and making bold moves. A bold move is a new library in central, in central downtown that brings Guelphites of all backgrounds together. A new library will give others access to resources to make bold moves for Guelph. Let's continue making history by making bold moves. It's time for a new library. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jesse, for your presentation. I have a Councillor McKinnon has a question. Uh, thank you, through Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks very much for your time. I know that the uh, Out on the Shelf is doing a fundraiser right now uh, called uh, 100 Queer to Care. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about if someone's interested in donating, how that would, uh, how they would approach your organization oh, about that? Sure, yeah. Um, I actually brought some business cards, so if anybody's <laughs> interested in those. Um, I guess the best way would be to go to our website, outontheshelf.com. Very simple. Um, we have a tab called 100 Queers Who Care. Um, so that gives anyone the $100, $400 a donation. It gives them the year membership. Um, and then we're putting on events throughout the year to have fun <laughs> and uh, get ourselves out there. And um, yeah, so at ontheshelf.com, at uh, 100 Queers Who Care is a tab on it. And um, if anybody wants additional information, out on the shelf at gmail.com. I answer that email personally, so <laughs> anyone is welcome to email that. Great, thank you. And although it's called the fundraiser is called 100 Queers Who Care, it's not just limited to people identify as queers. No, correct? it's yeah. for allies as well. Yeah, great. anyone who wants to support. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your question. Okay, th and thank you very much. Uh, Maggie Laidlaw, you're next. I don't think I saw Jason Blockhouse here. No. So Mike Schreiner, you will be in the wings. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, recently, I read a letter in the Mercury Tribune that caused my jaw to drop. It was titled, Take Time with Library Decision, and here are a few highlights. Extending the time before starting the big build of the new library is a very wise decision. Have we not learned that when people rush into things, the end product frequently has a flaw? Guthrie is correct when, and that was Guthrie's direct quote, is correct when he adds that the delays may be a good thing and that they're taking the time to get this right. I'd like you to ponder those words, especially the rush into things part, while I read a few sections of a column by former Guelph Mercury journalist Vic Kirsch. It was titled, The Library Could Be Part of a New Complex. At that time, the new complex was the old Memorial Garden site on Carden Street. And so we're, since we're all now seated on that old site, we can safely take that off the table. Permit me to read from that article. The Guelph Public Library was designed and built in the mid-1960s to serve a city population of 30,000. Today, with 140,000 items, a staff of 60, and 600,000 visits by the public annually, its 33,000 square feet of space are increasingly provo proving too little to meet the future head-on. It is not adequate for the staff required to service a population of 80 to 90,000, laments Chief Librarian Norm McLeod. McLeod estimates a new library would require a minimum of 50,000 square feet to allow for future growth as the city's population rises, as well as integration of services sure to spring up with rapidly evolving technology, such as fiber optics, which of course are here now, that has already taken hold in the US. There has been a library in the main branch site since 1905, the current building constructed in 1965 was expanded 10 years later. Since McLeod joined in 1977, public use has tripled. The library, including branches at Bullfrog and Scottsdale, now boasts an annual circulation of 1.174 million. 60% of this is from the main branch. A central problem for the main library is workspace. There is virtually no space to sort return books, for example. Both my kids were library pages and they will attest to this. It's a constant juggling act. This is made worse during holiday seasons. In the week before Christmas, for instance, circulation is down and books flood back. And that means the stacks are jammed full. He also said the library is really in a quandary. We've got to take this building into the year 2000, but the creaks and groans are getting more audible. When was this article written? In 1993. 
so even further back than some others have mentioned. That was 24 years ago. Those statistics quoted by Vic Kirsch are now vastly out of date. For example, our population is now approaching 140,000, according to the most recent Stats Canada information. In addition, 2.3 million items are checked out of the library every year, and considerably more than 1 million people visit the library annually. The average daily number of visitors is well over 3,000, which is more than the visit City Hall. In fact, the library is the city's busiest public facility. Yet we still lack a concrete design for a new main library, never mind a shovel in the ground. So I hardly think that more than 30 years of discussion and debate about the need for a new library is rushing into things. Notwithstanding the presence of more branch libraries, nothing can replace an efficient, welcoming, modern main library with all of its myriad uses, many of which have been highlighted earlier. It is a travesty that while beautiful libraries have sprung up in all of our contiguous municipalities, Guelph still has a main library that is more than 60 years old, is at least 30 years out of date, and is creaking and groaning even more than it was in 1993. Between 2003 and 2006, when the old post office was up for grabs, the majority, not all of Council Mary, but the majority of Council, in an astounding lack of foresight, failed to seize the opportunity to convert this beautiful old building into what would have been a magnificent main library, unlike Cambridge. And I'm sure Councillor Downer remembers that night as well as I do. We were on the losing side of that vote. Since then, we have dragged our feet on this issue and as a former council member, I count myself as one of those foot draggers, having failed to present a sufficiently forceful case for a new public library. I will close with a few points from American Tribune column I wrote in August of this year. Number one, the library is the great equaliser, as you've already heard, bridging the digital gap between those who can and those who cannot afford all of the technological gizmos available in today's world. Number two, our main library has some of the highest membership and highest usage statistics in Ontario, but we're still pushing out the main build until 2023 to 2027. That is 30 years from when that article was written. We do well to remember the words of American novelist E.L. Doctorow. The three most important documents a free society gives are a birth certificate, a passport, and a library card. In closing, I would strongly encourage Council to commit fully and definitively to a to a publicly funded, fully accessible Main Guelph Library as the only essential and vital component of the Baker Street redevelopment. Everything else is secondary. The library is not merely overdue, it is essential for the well-being of our beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you. And is there any questions at all at this time? Councillor Alt. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, um, uh, Ms. Laidlaw, if you can recollect, what was the projected cost for the library that never was? From the post office, you mean? Yes. I believe it was in the range of about 20 million. Thank you. Councillor Downer might know that more than I do. Oh, I could ask her later then. Okay, thanks. But I, I think it was, I know it's going to be more than twice that now, so it's a lost opportunity at that time. Okay. Okay, thank you. thank you very much for your presentation. Mike Schreiner, and is Karen here? Oh, she's already standing up. <laughs> and that's that will be our last uh, delegation tonight, so... So your Worship, Mayor Guthrie, members of council, staff, citizens, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, I was asked to speak in support of the library tonight, and I said yes for three reasons. The first is that I believe a modern public library is essential to a vital and vibrant downtown. I also think a modern public library is essential to, as a business and innovation hub for new startups in a new economy. And finally, I think a library is essential as a great equalizer in terms of the digital divide that exists in our society today. But out of respect for your time, I'm not going to be repetitive and say what many others have already said. But I want to quickly put on the record, I pulled this out of my bag because there's been so many issues that have been talked about tonight that I want to do a shout out to Guelph staff, frankly that when I was at AMO, you presented six infrastructure priorities that have really all been talked about tonight. Stormwater management, better trails, downtown revitalization and a library, recreation centers for the South End hub. And so I bring this up because I feel that you're on top of things. And I, and I want to make two really important points related to that. The first is that I hope that we've structured the capital budget in a way that we can 
take advantage of the good work you've done to leverage funding at either the provincial or federal level. And so my hope is, is that things are structured in that way. And that would be a question I would actually have for staff that we're prepared for that. And the second point I wanna make is there's been so many passionate citizens speak tonight. And I hope that we can take that passion, not only to city council, but we also take it to the province and the federal government, and we demand Guelph's fair share to fund many of the infrastructure needs that you've done such an excellent job of presenting to upper tier levels of government. So thank you. Thank you very much, and no questions. Thank you very much, Mike. Karen, you uh, are already down. And uh, thank you for waiting. Uh, since you're the last, it's always nice to uh, ha ha say thank you to you. So thank you very much. <laughs> Go ahead. Good evening, Mayor Guthrie and members of council. I actually requested to be last on the um, delegate list tonight, and so thank you for placing me there. Um, tonight, I'm actually hoping to speak about accessibility to council meetings in addition to the value of the library. Um, I, like many residents of Guelph, work nine to five. Um, holding this budget meeting at 2 p.m. on a workday makes it inaccessible and unattractive to many working people. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share my views, and I also regret that I was not able to hear the staff recommendations or the delegations of some of the other community members. Um, there is a policy on the city website called the Guiding Principles for Community Engagement. The very first First pr principle is inclusivity. It states that all community members have a reasonable opportunity to contribute. Scheduling meetings to hear public de delegations at 2 p.m. in the afternoon on a workday does not uphold this policy. These meetings are important and they need to be scheduled in evenings when everyone can attend, even if that means multiple evenings. Also, the deadline to sign up for delegations is more than six days prior to this meeting. Um, I don't believe that's really necessary. I think three or four days prior could be more appropriate. Um, the Friday 10 a.m. deadline makes sense to me for a Monday or Tuesday meeting, but when it reply, applies to meetings later in the week, it is restrictive. Um, also, budget documents could be made more accessible if they were provided online in multiple languages and if they were available in a large print format. Um, these steps can be taken easily to move Guelph governance closer to its chosen ideals. Um, in addition, last night I did not have a conclusive response from the clerk's office concern, it's concerning the videotaping of this meeting. Um, this is another barrier to access to governance in Guelph. Uh, next I'm going to speak about the library. When reviewing documents concerning the library, I have often come across the phrase business case. To me this seems very limited. Of course, the economic impact of a fantastic community space is crucial to consider. Unfortunately, viewing the case for a new library from only this perspective ignores the spectrum of benefits that this community hub can offer. I'm an early childhood educator and I attend many of the fantastic programs offered to children and caregivers that the library staff provide. These opportunities are not offered at, uh, sorry, at any of the other libraries in the city. School libraries, the university library, and out on the shelf are great community resources, but none of these resources begin to reach the youngest members of our community the way that the public library does. Mountains of scientific research concludes that early reading is the number one indicator of lifelong literacy. Academic success can be predicted by the quantity of time spent reading books with parents and caregivers. There is no substitute for reading. Children's programs in this city are busy community hubs of multicultural learning opportunities. Families attend who speak languages other than English at home. In the 1950s, my father started coming to school, um, coming from a household that only spoke Italian. Many of Guelph's children are in similar situations. I see at the library parents and grandparents packed in together, learning to speak English together and becoming a stronger community. But it's over full. There isn't room for more people. We 
are getting more folks. We're getting more folks who are not speaking English as a first language. This library needs to be built. The public library offers a space um, for kids to fall in love with reading. The programs are highlighted with bubbles, snakes, and stories of space. These public offerings are packed shoulder to shoulder. shoulder. Um, also, the, main, the current main library does not include any park space. The inclusion of an outdoor play learning area for children is crucial. Um, I have a quote that says, there will never be a civilized country until we spend more on books than we do on chill, uh, chewing gum. That's from Albert Hubert. It's a childish quote, and, a, and I approach this topic from a child-centered perspective, because that's my work and my passion. But it is with due seriousness that I approach this issue, and $100,000 is chewing gum. Delaying funding is um, denying funding. I got that uh, idea, that line from a library book last evening. Delaying funding is denying funding. Okay, well thank you very much, uh, Karen. Is there any questions for the delegation? Seeing none. Uh, oh, sorry, Council Down, did you have a, uh, no, not for the delegation, so thank, thank you. you very much. So now we're at staff, and sorry, Councillor Downer, then I'll head around to everybody else, okay? Yeah, I have a few questions to stop. But first, I want to thank all the delegations. I've, the, the, the community's been very passionate about the library and continues to be, and it's great to continue to hear that support, and I hope that everybody comes back on February the 13th when the library presents its business case, because, sorry, Anne, you'll have to come back again. Um, and thanks, Mary, for the, uh, the ride down memory lane. I was first elected in 1994 at the age of 39, and my youngest was four. So it's been a long ride for me as well on the library, and I hope to live to see the library built. Um, and to the end... The question of Councillor Alt in 2003, the price for the library was around 18 million, and I chaired the uh, committee that with the uh, city hall, and the city hall was going to be 25 million. And then an election came a few months later that was turned around, and um, only the city hall came back on the books three months later with an additional cost to redo the whole process again. So delays are very expensive and have been in the history. So I just wanted to sort of fill in some of those gaps. So it has been a long time uh, for myself as well. But what I did want to do, though, is um, there's been a lot of comments made around the process, around incomplete RFPs. And I think um, Mike has raised a good point that others have raised. Are we ready if we get, if there's any funding? from the feds of the province. So maybe I could ask our CIO to sort of recap. Um, the, the, has the RFP gone out? Do we feel it's complete enough to come back with council's motion around um, uh, the library being included? Maybe you could sort of run the community through the process or uh, somebody from finance around how the financing is structured the way it is. Uh, maybe just an opportunity to sort of educate the people that are still here around the process that we're in, because I, I did hear some misinformation tonight about how this funding is working. And also to answer the question around, are we ready if there's um, funding coming from other levels of government? So maybe just sort of wrap all those things up. Thanks. I'll try. Um, so I'm going to rely on some staff that um, have <coughs> intimate knowledge of the details around the RFP. Um, but let me start with um, the question about are we ready if there is provincial or federal funding? Yes, absolutely we are. Um, we actually, as uh, Mike uh, eloquently said uh, earlier, um, we have been lobbying uh, a number of uh, infrastructure projects for the last two years, and they've always included a library component. Uh, we continue to do that. Um, we, uh, at Council's direction last year, we included some additional money to help with, this, with the business case development. Uh, we set up a working team because Council felt it important to, to move this, this initiative forward, and, we, and we've done that. Uh, we've uh, just recently solidified our governance structure around the actual construction and how that would work. 
and simply, uh, I know the library, and I don't want to speak for Steve, um, have been working hard with with their uh, consultant to develop the business case, and that business case will come forward answering uh, many of the questions around um, program and costing and size. Um, so I know that work is well underway. Um, we we regularly discuss the, those uh, those things. So that's where we are in the process as of today. As far as the RFP for Baker goes, I'm going to ask Peter Peter Cartwright, or is, is it Peter Cartwright or Peter Brasado? I'm sorry. Oh, it's Peter Cartwright. Sorry. Um, around uh, the uh, the details around the RFP. So uh, on that, uh, if there's nothing further from me, I'm going to ask Peter to answer uh, that part of the question. Uh, thank you very much. There is an inside joke there, which I'll share with, with you sometime if you have an interest. Um, through uh, Mayor Guthrie uh, to, uh, to Council, uh, staff are just finalizing the RFP at this point in time. Uh, the way that we have structured the RFP is based upon the Council endorsed concept for the Baker Street site, which is a mixed-use development. Uh, part of that mixed-use development does include a 90,000 square foot uh, library. That was uh, determined through public consultation, shareholder consultation quite a few years ago and brought to council and endorsed. Uh, the RFP process itself is gonna be a staged process. So the first stage uh, will be an expression of interest where we go out to the, the marketplace uh, with the concept. And what we're gonna be seeking at that stage are responses from the development community with respect to their interest in developing uh, that project or something quite similar to it. We're also going to be asking for their expertise in doing those type of projects and their experience. So basically what we want to get to is a point where we've uh, pre-qualified some developers. That allows council the opportunity to still talk about the library and make a decision on what the library would look like, at square footage, and uh, consider the business case that's coming forward in February. So at that point in time, the two processes are actually going to start to merge a little closer together, the RFP process and the, uh, the business plan uh, from the library. And once we know what the decision has been made on the library, then we will, we will uh, provide supplemental information back out to the market and indicate what uh, the direction is with respect to the library. So that's the approach that we're taking, um, and I'll be glad to try to answer any further questions to, to that. Uh, just for you, Mr. Mayor, I, my understanding too is that the library uh, will be doing further public engagement around their own design and what will be in the library. And, and Steve could, my understanding that from their press release last week, that's what they said as well. Through, through you, Mr. Mayor, maybe Mr. Kraft could answer that question on, on their specific engagement activities that they have planned. To you, Mayor, thank you for the question. <clears throat> yes, we're gonna, I'm working with KPMG to develop a schedule for a more thorough, concrete um, public involvement in this particular process. So we don't have dates or times yet at this point, but we're working with, as I say, Bruce from KPMG to develop that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just sort of maybe the, the, was my final question then was around how is it 100 million this year and so much next year and then? Oh, sorry, 100,000, sorry. <laughs> Boy, I'm wishful thinking it. <laughs> 100,000 and so forth. So that may be finance. I don't, it doesn't matter who answers that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Downer. Uh, so the 100,000 was specifically asked for by the library to help top up, I believe, their work that they're doing on the business case, if I'm not misunderstood. Um, and then we, we did sort of the, the calculation on the square footage and, and broke it out into what we believe is the best um, schedule for design, which I think is 1.9 million in, in 19, and then well, I'm, it's getting a little late, so I think it's around 56 million in uh, 20. So that that is best practice when building a large project, is that you have design documents, all that in the first year, and then the second year is fully construct, um, because there's a number of factors that go into cash flow and, and some other things that have to be worked out. Um, that's the, the purpose that we work through for the forecast for this particular project. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Downer. Councillor Salisbury. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, following up, actually, on Councillor Downer's question, this is more of a takeaway. I don't really ex need or expect an answer tonight. But uh, similarly, I, 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 I understand a lot of the comments that were made with regards to process. Uh, one of the delegates, I think it was Jonathan Webb, was particularly critical on the process that, that we had and raised a number of issues that were beyond my understanding as to how they related to, to what we were doing. I, I wouldn't mind if, uh, if staff could just take it offline and maybe, maybe uh, uh, respond to those criticisms. Uh, there's going to be a question of, of, uh, of uh, philosophy, philosophical approach, as well as maybe technicalized, but they, they, they seemed rather concerning, but I, would, I, I don't have enough information to know whether or not I should be concerned. So as I say, I don't think it's necessary tonight, but I wouldn't mind, you know, just a quick response from staff would be great. Uh, certainly, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Salisbury. So I don't know if um, the delegate actually gave us a written presentation specifically on his questions. Um, but from, from my recollection of, of him at the mic, um, certainly was critical about the lack of detail on the RFP for Baker Street. And as you know, Council endorsed that to go into the RFP at the time. Um, and I think we explained at the time that, that, that the Library Board had not finalized their program of work and that we would leave it as a placeholder. Um, Mr. Cartwright has quite elegantly said that this is a two-phase approach. So we're confident that once we do the pre-qualification and uh, the library will come back in September that they'll merge together and then that RFP for the second stage will be much more. February. Sorry, February. Sorry, it's getting late. Um, so when it comes together in February and the second, the second stage of that RFP will go out, it'll be much more succinct around uh, that purpose. And I can talk a little bit about, about the business case process. As, as Council's aware, um, we, we had a number of um, initiatives recommended to us by Deloitte and Touche on our Tier 1 capital projects. This Council endorsed those uh, recommendations, endorsed the project management office, which included best practice for Tier 1 projects. Uh, as we work through the, the working committee with the library, we, we have clearly identified this project as a Tier 1 project. And therefore, there was certain um, certain information that needed to be um, uh, thought through and, and reaffirmed, I might add. And that's why we're in the delay to get that information. So, But I can certainly understand how members of the public may, may have been confused about how that may have uh, come about. Um, I think quite clearly um, the library and the library board are playing a role in the program of their building and certainly we're there to support them. No, I appreciate that. I feel much uh, reassured, absolutely. Uh, my understanding from what I'm hearing then is that really this first stage is a pre-qualification stage, uh, looking for interest in And to that end, um, I'm just, uh, would, the only other follow-up question I would have would be how proactive are we in terms of uh, uh, going, specifically going out to uh, the private sector development community that has experience with this or may have uh, experience in projects like this uh, rather than just Bedingo or whatever the, the type of, of approach we have. Are we actually specifically reaching out and contacting people asking them to, to bid on, on this pre-qualification? Um, did you want to, I saw both hands go up. I don't know, I don't know if... Uh, I think I think uh, in an RFP process you have to be careful that you aren't favoriting if that's if that's a word uh, by going out to developers and but I I might be wrong uh, you go ahead uh, if you've dealt with that before I don't I think you have to be be very open and non biased uh, yes uh, through you uh, Mayor Guthrie I want to be a bit cautious in terms of answering the, the, your question uh, Councillor Salisbury but we have engaged. Uh, uh, Collins Barrow again. They did the market sounding work for us that identified uh, Baker as the, uh, the the priority site. So the the RFP is actually going to be uh, uh, implemented and issued uh, with the assistance of Collins Barrow, who have uh, contacts within the development industry. And uh, they similar to what we did with the RFI, they're going to be quite proactive in promoting this opportunity to their their contacts and through their connections and uh, their their contacts. Um, if I may, one other point I would like to maybe raise, um, and it follows on uh, 
our CAO's comment about Tier 1 projects. Uh, likewise, we've set up this RFP process as a Tier 1 project because of the complexity of it. So we're following the same governance models that you see in a lot of the complex capital projects that we report back to you on a periodic basis, on a regular basis actually, and we're, we're following the same protocols. So in developing the RFP, initiating the RFP, and assessing the feedback that we get, it's all being done as a Tier 1 project because of the complexity of not only the, the development site itself, but also uh, things like the library and, and other matters uh, related to this piece of property. And just to, just to follow up, if I might, just want to, as a follow-up question around the RFP. It's, it's public, am I right? Like when the RFP is ready to go out, it's public, anyone can see it. Yes, as soon as it is uh, issued, it'll, it'll be publicly announced and, uh, and communicated and advertised. So this is not a, uh, yeah. a closed bid, that's right. okay. if you will. It is going to be a public process. Yep. Yeah. So that's important for everyone to know about that. Thank you, Councillor Salisbury. Right beside you, Councillor Alt. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Guthrie. Um, I, I don't want to, uh, to really muddy the, the waters, but uh, um, uh, there, are, there are a couple of questions that came up for me, and I wonder if staff uh, could come back at some point uh, to address a couple of concerns that have been raised by the public, both through the presentations now and through, through emails to me and perhaps other councillors as well. I did a, a quick calculation of what the square the cost per square foot is if it's based on uh, I think it's um, approximately 58 59 million dollars and 90,000 square feet and I just am curious if I got the correct answer which is six hundred and twenty two dollars per square foot for building costs I'm just curious about that the other thing that that is a concern and I, and I think it was very well expressed here is are we narrowing the RFP perhaps too much much to include in some of the amenities in Baker Street redevelopment, uh, such as perhaps a YMCA and affordable housing, um, to the point where uh, any any respondents would have difficulties being able to put together an effective RFP. Because many many people pointed out that one of the key points of a library is that it becomes a a meeting place for. Uh, uh, new Canadians for people that that are on limited incomes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just I was hoping you perhaps you could address it either now or offline. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, our, our CAO will uh, respond to that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Alt. So I, I, I'm cautious about wanting to talk about details of an open RFP that it may persuade or influence a potential contractor at this point. Um, I think we we did a benchmark. Uh, budget for, for that size of, of facility with the programming that may go within it. Um, I want a completely open and transparent and uh, sort of sounding of what somebody would bring to the table for, the, for that land. So I'm, I'm a little sort of cautious around wanting to get into very specific details and not have what I want to be a completely open process be somehow uh, guided to one way or another. Um, and just on the YMCA, I, I um, also have a very good relationship with the, the, the CEO of the YMCA. We do have a letter of commitment from them that uh, they'd be looking for a specific square footage in their minds. They Them themselves have just recently uh, had a conversation about their going through their business case analysis right at the same time. So they've given us a sort of, here's what we think the square footage is we're going to need. Uh, but they're working through that same business case process right now as well. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Your answer is appreciated, and I appreciate your your concerns about uh, being as cautious as possible discussing any significant elements of the RFP. Thank you. I, I know, I, and, and by the way, this is not what I'm about to say leveraging at all about what Councillor Alta said. It's, I'm just putting it here before I go to the next councillor. Uh, let's just remember that we're here about the capital budget tonight. And it's easy. I, in fact, even myself, I, uh, throughout all the delegations, I've been writing stuff down. You know, we've all been writing stuff down and thinking, oh, I'm going to respond to that or that and that. But we're not, we're, not, we're not here to talk about the operating details of a library. Uh, we are here to talk about the capital, <laughs> capital works, specifically to the library, because we just ended that with all the delegations. But I, I just want to sort of focus us back to, uh, to that. And, and that includes me with a lot of the stuff that I wrote down on my page here too. Uh, now, thank you. Councillor Gordon, you were next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I too uh, want, I, I think it would be unanimous around this horseshoe to express gratitude for the inspiring 
delegations and their passion and their commitment. Um, I, I want to speak, I have a question for staff that needs a little perspective. I've, I've spent a lot of time on that side of that overly intimidating and unnecessary glass wall. <laughs> um, and I try to look at both perspectives. When I speak about the passion, the commitment, and the vision that we're hearing from our delegates, I am privileged enough to be on this side of that glass wall. And I have to tell you, I also hear that passion and commitment from our staff and from our councillors. But there's a dissonance somewhere in there that I would like to ask a couple questions about. Um, I think if there was a dominant, a dominant question raised by a majority of the delegates, it's their concern that we haven't made a, a big enough commitment in this capital budget to assuage their fears that this might be yet another weight, as Mary Mulholland said. Um, and I've, I've seen a lot of numbers. I think they do get confusing. But the biggest question, and maybe I'll ask this to Ms. Baker uh, to clarify yet again, was, well, why, why doesn't it make sense to make that a dollar amount this year in the budget that looks to the public as if, yes, we're serious about it? Um, I think I've heard the answers, and I heard both councillors McKinnon and Wettstein explain, and you, you had an answer that why it might not make sense. But I think those concerns from the public come from years of skepticism, years of what they've seen as broken commitments, broken promises, uh, being misled. I think the operative syllable in library to some of them is lie. We, they want to make sure it's a truth brary or whatever that we're, that we can we can look that it's that we're moving forward. Can you tell us? Uh, maybe it's maybe you feel like you're going to be repeating yourselves, but I do hear a clear pathway financially. Uh, we've made all the commitments, but there still is that dissonance that because of that cynicism, we go, well, is it real? Um, can you outline once more how staff got to the current plan that they have and how it feels, how it is just as significant to you a commitment as if there was a, a big chunk of money in the 2018 budget before we've seen the business plan too? So three through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we've, I believe, said it a few times tonight. So I will, I will again uh, reiterate. Repetition is uh, going to be helpful. Huh? Right. So council made a decision earlier this year, just a couple months ago, where they uh, approved the library going in the RFI process, and that we're coming back in February um, to hear the business case related to the next steps of the library. And part of that business case will have costing and um, there's gonna be a public engagement process and all of that information is needed in order for us to recommend any kind of um, budget. And we don't have that information right now. And so staff's recommendation is that we wait until February before we make any uh, budgeting decisions. I think, I, think that's, I think that's what we need to hear. Um, and what are our options for, I've, I've heard from the community, but this is the capital budget. This is when we need to make that commitment. What are our options for budgeting when we hear that business plan in February? So through you, Mr. Mayor, the, as, as I've also indicated, we have debt capacity available for this project. And at that time in February, uh, if the council decides or if, if that's uh, the, with the business case before us, we have the flexibility similar to what, our, what 
our CAO has said, to um, we have the flexibility to access that debt funding um, in order to move the design forward at a quicker pace or to access other grants and, and levels of, uh, from other levels of government um, when that time arises. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. And one thing I was um, pleased with as a member of the library board, that we can move forward together if we share that common vision. And again, if there's still a dissonance, uh, I just urge us all to work hard towards creating that sense that we're all on the same side with it. And then we'll uh, make Ms. Mulholland happy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right beside you, Councillor Hoffman. Yes, thank you, through you, Mayor Guthrie. I, too, have been really inspired this evening by all the delegates, and I applaud you all, and even those that, that are not here that had to leave. I applaud you all. I just feel, I, I was feeling speechless and feel very humbled to be sitting here this evening, so thank you all. I want to follow up on some of the things that I've learned just in this conversation. When Councillor Downer asked our CAO about uh, the upcoming plans, so I wondered if it would be possible for um, our CAO, along with Peter Cartwright and others that spoke about next steps, to uh, put together a communication for all of council, like an internal memo, a fact sheet, because I heard some dates, I heard some uh, timelines, I heard um, about an, uh, where we are, the RFP. I don't want all the details, because I know you can't talk about the RFP, but I think what's important is that we're all on the same page, the community, council, and staff, and if we had this internal uh, reference sheet, I think it would be really helpful. It can be broad, it can be highlights. You don't have to delve into all the details. Would that be possible, Mr. Thompson? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hoffman. Absolutely, we can put together a timeline uh, we'll, um, we'll also engage our partners at the library and make sure we get their milestones as well. And we'll put together a complete timeline with milestones. And, and I appreciate the fact that you realize that we don't want to get into specifics about the RFP process. So we may be a little bit more vaguer in, in that regard. Um, but certainly we can put that together. I, I, I'm sure my colleagues as well as myself would really appreciate that because then we have a communication that we can um, send out to our, our constituents when they're asking us questions about the process. The other thing I was wondering is about, um, we've talked a bit about, I think we called it the leverage or the means. So I remember several years ago when the infrastructure uh, money was announced and um, our community was fortunate to get a lot of money but it was one third, one third, and one third. So we got a third from the province, a third from the feds, and we as a municipality had to come up with a third as well. So we talk about leveraging, we, we talk about um, shovel ready. So if something were to come along in the next several months or the next year, because we are going into an election, would it be possible for us, I'm just throwing this out there, to debt finance something? Like where would the money, do we have any ideas around how we could um, be able to show them the money? Through you Mr. Mayor and Councillor Hoffman. Um, so we, we've already indicated that we have debt capacity um, available if in fact that was to happen. Um, as you know we made some uh, changes to our reserve balances and, and reserves this year and part of that report we were specific about wanting to be able to be um, sort of ready for provincial or federal grants and, and we had some funds available within those reserves to be able to access those so I know uh, finance staff and myself have had many conversations about wanting to be nimble and be ready um, once the bilaterals are signed and we're hopeful they will be done soon and then we'll know what uh, what the percentage is. I've heard as much as 50 to 33, 33. So, we're, you know, we wait in anticipation. And I know our uh, 
our friend uh, that regularly uh, visits the province has been uh, out there talking for us as well around uh, moving those things forward quickly. Um, so we're, we believe we're in a, a good position if, in fact, that that funding could become available quickly. Um, I will say, though, from a shovel-ready perspective, uh, we're, we're 18 months away from having a design to be shovel-ready, and that's, in my opinion, best-case scenario. Uh, so there is a time gap around design uh, that would play a role in that. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I was mostly interested in the means, and you did address that, so thank you. And over to Councillor Wettstein. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it's tough to get into the RFP details, and I hope these two, two factors aren't seen as being getting into detail. But, but I really think what we're struggling with right now is our 2018 capital budget is $100,000. That's all we're dealing with tonight. We're not dealing with any financial commitment of any kind, any shape, any form, partially because, as Tara very well pointed out, we can't until we complete some processes. But to me, the struggle that I have a little bit, and I do appreciate uh, Derek's comment on, on the fact that it, we can fund it. We can choose not to. And this isn't a staff question. Staff have laid it out. They've answered all the questions. They showed we have the capacity. Staff have done 100% of the job. The only job that's going to be left after we get a recommendation from staff on the business case in February is whether council has the will to spend $60 million with perhaps some partnership help on a 90,000 square foot library. And it's no more complex than that. We're going to have to make that decision in February. And the question will then be, when we go into the 2019 budget, which will be the next council's, they're going to be looking at up to $2 million to bring it into the next step. The unanswered question for me, however, is no developer, no RFP, no federal or provincial government is going to get seriously committed to the numbers unless at that point we are committed to the 50 million in the following one, two, or three years. And that's where I think our tier one program allows us to do that. And we've already identified where the money's coming from. Substantially, it's going to be from debt. I think that's probably the number one thing we have to recognize. To the extent that we can get government help, that's great. To the extent that we have some reserves, that's great. To the extent that there's DCs, which you understand are minimal of anything, that's all great. What I think I heard staff say is we have the capacity to implement our vision next February financially if we choose to. Is that fair? And I think that's really important. So therefore, when we have our meeting in February, uh, we're going to have done the legwork, staff's going to have done the RFP, RFP work, and we'll be bringing forward a recommended decision based on our vision to implement this business case over the next two years. And I think we just need to be ready for it. it in order to meet our vision, it's going to be somewhere around 90,000 square feet, and it's going to be somewhere around $60 million. And then we're going to have to fund it. I just want to make sure it's accurate on that understanding. Thanks. And uh, I, I had another quick uh, follow-up from Councillor Salisbury, then it's uh, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, just to follow up on Councillor Gordon's question, this has gone around and around, but help me understand. <clears throat> we know that we're going to spend money. We're planning. It's like I, I liken this to uh, I'm planning on purchasing a car next year. I've been pre-approved, so I've got debt financing, good to go, ready to ready to go. I don't know whether it's a car or a motorcycle. I don't know what brand it is. I don't know any of the details, but I know I'm buying some wheels, mm -hmm. and I know I'm going to spend money to do so, uh, and I've got debt financing to cover it. But when I look at the debt financing on a 56 million dollar project, even if we only had one-third to pay for, um, that's about a half a million dollars a year for 40 years. So why, in knowing, without knowing any of the details of the business plan, but committing to that course of action, why would we not commit a half a million dollars in this budget? Because we know we're going to need to spend it. Either spend it now or spend it next year, uh, but we know what's going to happen. So why would, why would we not be looking to put our money where our mouth is in this budget uh, with all those unknowns? CAO would like to respond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to um, Councillor Salisbury. Well, quite clearly, from a staff perspective, you have not given that direction. And until you give that direction, 
and staff will take that back and, and look at different funding scenarios. But right now, there is no direction. Okay. And staff are putting putting in the forecast because that's the right thing to do. Uh, we're doing due diligence because that's the right thing to do. And we're following best practices, which is you don't pull $60 million out of a debenture if you're not going to build it in two years. Absolutely. So, I mean, that, that that's the long and the short of why best practices suggest you don't pull that kind of money out until you're ready to actually build it. So, and, and we're looking forward to uh, February and hopefully we'll, we'll have that, you, you, pardon me, we'll have that debate around the horseshoe. Excellent. And, and that's a, you're a f fantastic question. So this is a, just a comment for my colleagues around the horseshoe. We've sat and listened to story after story after story of council after council getting to this point. But until we actually put the money down on the table, and I would suggest that we would, you know, as I say, even if, you know, best case scenario, um, we were f debt financing one third of this, uh, and, and we ran it over 40 years or 50 years, whatever the number is, that number starting this year is our commitment that we're actually serious. I would suggest that my fear is that we're in the same place that many other councils have been before for decades. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, and uh, I'm, if you don't mind, Councillor Gibson, uh, Councillor Westine, uh, I think wanted to just respond to the same train of thought that Councillor. Yeah, so please, please go ahead. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dan. Yeah, I, I think the key, uh, other key question I wanted to raise was the fact that normally we do our budgeting in the fall. The 2019 budget isn't going to be done until the first quarter of 2019 because of the council change. So. How significant is that going to be in terms of not knowing until really the first quarter of 2019 whether, in fact, the $2 million for 2019 is going to get approved by the council? Does anybody want to give us some understanding of that? Through, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councilor Wedstein, um, in, in actual facts, staff will be working on the 2019 budget without you, and I hope that's not offensive. Um, <laughs> To, to have it ready um, for ho hopefully first quarter of 2019, but it, but it does bring up the time the time lag around how you would how you would fund it. I mean we we'd have to get our head wrapped around around um, what makes most financial sense for us and what tool we would use over what course of time. Um, and, and really, the best place to do that is when you make that decision in February. Just one follow-up, I might I appreciate that, and I do uh, really appreciate the fact that staff are going to be doing something that many people around this horseshoe may not be around for when the decision ultimately has to be made. And I'm a little bit of a skeptic. As councils change, they sometimes change their mind, but what they like with the previous council, we can approve this thing in February to go forward. But when the next council does the 2019 budget, they can shoot it all down. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I think I answered this question earlier today, and which yeah. is, it's at council's will. Council, council yeah. can reconsider any right. decision they make at any time, yeah. as so long it, as it meets yeah. with And, and I, I respect that. It is at that council's will, just like it was at our will when we came on as a new council. Thank you. And Councillor Gibson, I'm going to ask for your patience one more time because Councillor Downer uh, is motioning that she's the same topic. So I, I want to stay on topic. So. Sorry, three. So I just wanted to count, uh, respond to Councillor Salisbury's comment. We actually have not been this far before. So to say that we've let that, that this has happened because of this. We haven't been this far before and since the 2003 and even before that. It was only in 2003 and the funding was actually there. The council had it all approved, the funding was there and then there was an election. And it was an election that happened. It wasn't anything else other than an election and the majority of the next council did not want to move forward with the library. It did not mean, there was funding. There was just the will of the next council. The other thing I would point out that that 
as Councillor Wettstein has said, there are, I've gone through like five major projects. There are decision points along the way that this can get turned up at any time. It could get turned around in February. It can get turned around by the next council. So until you have that final vote, and I remember when the river run was a great thing. There was a number of decisions along the way, and you know, uh, Joe Young, Mary Young, God bless him, was was you know he ran on a platform to not build that, but there there was another vote and he lost that vote and he, he very graciously, like I said, God bless him, like came and supported it. But I, that was, uh, you know, there's always many decisions along the way where this can go off the rails. But we are closer now than we have been since 2003. And so I'm feeling very optimistic and, and I'm optimistic that there's quite a bit of support around the horseshoe here in this term. But yes, next year, I mean, the whole Baker Street project, it, that's the vulnerability of four-year terms. That's politics. That's, that's what happens in the community, and that's why the community needs to stay engaged if they, you know, to do this. Thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Gibson now. <laughs> I had comments about an hour ago, but I'm kidding. <laughs> You're um, very patient. Yeah, no, my, it's fine. Uh, my apologies to everyone. I wanted to stay on the same topic, so. So this library file, there's a lot of people who have a lot more history than I have had on this library file, and I just continue to lean on uh, other senior levels, senior um, councillors who have been on this, and uh, when it comes to us for decisions, that's when we chew on it and when we eat it, and we've been following a good process, and um, I'm just confident in the business case is what I want to have in front of me before I, before I really weigh in and start asking questions, but it's, anyway. Uh, I will move the motions that have been recommended to us if I have a seconder. I have Councillor sure. Bell. Looks like Councillor Bell. Uh, am I allowed to speak now? Sure. I, 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 I'm last. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I mean, I'm the one that just like 20 minutes ago said, try to keep this on capital, and I'm going to try my best to keep it on capital. Um, I, I'm going to just talk about uh, uh, support or the commitment around the horseshoe, and I think you, you've touched on it, Councillor Gordon, Councillor Downer, many of you uh, have talked about it. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I, was, I was looking up here on uh, an article from a year and a half or, or more ago when, and I, look, I'm just, I'm just speaking about me because uh, obviously uh, I'm the one that changed my mind, okay? So, and everyone knows that. But uh, uh, just let me find it here, everybody. Just for, give me, give me a moment. Here it is. Guthrie surprised a meeting of council about a library motion, and then here, here's the quote. It's. Uh, I want. I want to send a signal to the private sector from a land development point of view. This is a year and a half ago. But. It's equally sending an important signal to the citizens of Guelph that I also value the library, he said. As well, he hopes the motion is also a positive signal to council that we can rally around this issue and not con continue to perpetuate incorrect rhetoric about the library. And I only say that because I acknowledge it's a year and a half ago that that was made. There, I have not felt, my glasses back on here, I have not felt any incorrect rhetoric around the library for the last year and a half, like I, by any by anybody, at all. There has been, as Councillor Downer said, several several motions made by you and Councillor Alt and myself, I think, and uh, maybe even others. And I think they've all been unanimous. Uh, I'm almost positive they've all been unanimous. I bet you there's five or six motions this term that were all unanimous by this council when it comes to trying to get. A capital project, got to say the word capital since we're talking about that, like a library done. Uh, so the other thing too is, and this is, th this is not me second guessing a council's decision um, at, uh, at all that was made a few months ago, but it was a, it was a close one. It was, a, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think it was a 7-6 vote if I recall. Only one of those, you know, handful that's happened in the last uh, few years. And, and that was when we had our surplus and we were looking to allocate our surplus, I, I indicated that I would like a certain amount, I think it might have been $2 million, I think, what, what was my motion, and I said to allocate it to the infrastructure towards Baker Street. So we gotta send a signal, we gotta make sure that we're sending a signal that we're serious about it, 
And councils will. It's fine. Like, I'm not mad about it at all. That's not a hill to die on. But you, we all, as a council, as a whole, said, no, we're not going to do that. So now we're talking. So now the now the discussion comes up now at budget time, that uh, that how can we send a signal to the community that we're serious? It's not just a hundred thousand. How can we send more of a signal? Well, a few months ago, we had an option to do that that would not be debt financing, that would not be going into debt to do it. We had we had a surplus that was mentioned that we could put towards Baker Street, and we said no. So now uh, now looking back, by the way. I, I think that that's okay because of the process issue. The process issue of getting to, um, especially with the library now, right? The library business case. And that, that echoes a couple of the comments I think that maybe were made by uh, some of the delegations that uh, it's okay to, to pause here to get it right. And this pause, if we could call it, is the business case that's being done properly so that we can make the right decision uh, in February. I know it's $100,000, like I get it, it's an, op it's an optics thing, right? You'd rather it be 1.1. I mean, that would, would that make everyone feel better? Maybe. Us, maybe the, maybe the, maybe the public too. But the reality is, is that the process is dictating that we do it in the right way. And it's a tier one capital project, it's this council that approved the tier one capital project process based on the large capital pro uh, process that did not go well in this city. Okay, so we're now making sure that we do all of our things, uh, capital projects, well as we move forward, including the po police uh, renovation, and, that, and, now, and now the library, right? So I just wanted to give just a little bit of sort of how I'm feeling on some things here as well, because it's my only time to talk before I call the vote. And uh, I, I appreciate you, you letting me say that. Uh, there, is, there is no, I, I, feel, I feel nothing around this horseshoe uh, as you, uh, properly said, Councillor Gordon, or on that side of the glass, like it, I, I feel there's there's this un there's unity. That's the word I'm looking for, and uh, it, it just just because there isn't a one million one hundred thousand dollar ask does not mean that the effort on this side, including staff, by the way, is is any less. That's that's I think my my point on that. Okay, with that, I'll call the vote. And the vote's active, everybody. One more to vote, I've been told. Thank you. Oh, you know what? One very, I'm sorry, one ex extremely quick comment. I, I wanted to, I, I had it written down here, if you just uh, bear with me. Uh, Karen uh, Del, Del Vecchio, am I saying the Del Vecchio. Um, Del Vecchio, my apologies. I just wanted to acknowledge your opening comments about timing of the meeting. That has been mentioned a little bit by some others on this side of the glass, if I may say that as well. Uh, and uh, we always every year have an opportunity to uh, debrief on the year prior. And so I just wanted to acknowledge your comments. They, they, aren't, uh, they aren't coming out of nowhere. So um, thank you for letting me, letting me say that. With that, a motion to adjourn, please. Councillor Bell, Councillor Gibson is seconding the motion to adjourn. Yep. Okay. All in favor, everybody? That passes. Thank you very much.